To anyone working in the film industry, Sujata, if they had to put a time limit on becoming a working professional, what would that be? Never put a time limit on art, I would say. Because I, I have found throughout my years, there have been a lot of my friends and acquaintances that I've been in touch with or met in acting class or through writing. And anyone who puts a time limit on it, such as if I don't do this thing within a year or if I don't do this particular goal within two or three years, then I'm going to go back to X, Y, Z, which could be anything, which could be, in my case, you know, I have an engineering degree. So if I were to say that, okay, I need to get to direct a studio film within five years or else I'm going to go back to engineering. I feel like the universe hears that and listens to that and says, okay, you have this backup plan. So it, it, it won't give you that first thing that you want. And I, I just think it's a, everybody says this, but it's a marathon, not a sprint. And I've noticed that, you know, there are goals that I hope to have wished to achieve by this point, which I haven't achieved, but I'm enjoying the journey. And the journey has been so much fun. So it's all about waking up in the morning, being excited that you actually get to pursue your dream and enjoying the moment that you're in, whether it's, oh, you get to go pitch to a certain executive or studio or network today, or whether it's you get to go have coffee with a certain writer that you uh, are inspired by. And, and just taking those little experiences and making that exciting and making that a goal as opposed to I need to sell a show by this date or I need to be a series regular by this date. Um, so I truly believe you can't put a, a time limit on your dreams. When you were getting that engineering degree, was that your plan A at the time? No, <laughs> that was always my plan B. So I, I'll take it back to my childhood where I was always dancing, singing, writing, acting, but I was also really good at math and science. It came easy to me. And when I entered middle school, I started doing plays. When I entered high school, I started doing musicals and I was always dancing every week. And my parents were very supportive and they would come to Guys and Dolls every night and bring a bouquet of flowers and cheer for me. And it was always really exciting. But then I was also taking AP Physics, AP Bio, AP Chem, AP Calculus, and killing it on those exams as well. So my plan, my master plan, I started thinking about when I was about 16 or 17 and I said to myself, okay, I can't move to Hollywood at the age of 17. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go get this engineering degree and take it from there and then move out to LA after I graduate. And so I went to get my engineering degree and in the meantime, continued to do plays and musicals and continue to write. In college, I took a semester of screenwriting. I took a semester of playwriting. And then I, the summer before my senior year of college, I interned at a company called Accenture, which is a global consulting firm, really big name. Um, they're on par with Deloitte and Touche and Ernst and & Young and had a fun summer interning there. And at the end of that summer, I was offered a full-time job. So this was even before going into my senior year. So they asked me where I wanted to work, what city I wanted to work in. And I said, Los Angeles. And I said, Los Angeles. And they said, great, that's where we'll send you after you graduate. So I went into my senior year already having a job. And as soon as I graduated, I moved to LA on Accenture's dime. And then I was on a salary. So I was making a shitload of money at the age of 20, pretty much. And the thing about consulting is you never have to work unless you're placed on a project. 
So basically that entire year that I worked there, I was only on a project for about two weeks. And I was the worst Accenture employee you could ever think of. And I just had all my phone calls go to my cell phone, never went into work. And in the meantime, what I was doing was meeting with agents. I was going to acting class. I was getting headshots. I was auditioning. And at the end of that year working for Accenture, I got laid off, which was also awesome <laughs> because I got severance. I got unemployment and for about eight to 10 months, I believe. I was just, yeah, I was just like making money. And that's when I ramped up my auditioning. And about, I don't know, months later, I booked three national commercials in a row. So that's when my professional career started, I believe. And in the meantime, I was still writing scripts, still writing shorts, writing short stories, poems, songs, etc. And that's how I got into acting. But it was all part of the master plan of like, okay, I don't want to be a burden to my parents. I want to be able to support myself. What's the best way I can do that? Okay, let's take this job in this other field, which is kind of the perfect day job, to be honest. And then I moved out here and did it on my own. How did you get word that you were being laid off? What was hilarious was I was, like I told you, I was a terrible employee. So it was a round of layoffs. A bunch of employees were getting laid off at the same time. And I was one of them. I came in and the HR lady who I had become friends with she was really sad and disappointed that she had to lay me off. And I was like, I'm good. <laughs> Please don't waste your emotions on me. And, and it, was, it was a good day. <laughs> How many Plan Bs have you had while you've been here in Los Angeles? I've had zero Plan Bs. I, I've had the day jobs, which have been really fun, actually, I think. There was always a dream of me even being an engineer. The dream that you see in TV and in the movies of an aspiring actor is they're working at a restaurant or they're working uh, as a hostess somewhere. And that's what I did. And I had so much fun because I was finally surrounded by creative people because everyone Working in the restaurant business in Los Angeles generally tends to be an artist, and that is their day job. So I had a blast. I worked at a diner. I worked at a fancy steakhouse. And then I realized that I really loved hostessing, so I was working the front of desk at these places. And it was really fun. I was meeting all these people, working at really hot, trendy spots in LA, and making friends. And I never considered that a plan B. That was always just me making friends and making my home in Los Angeles, surrounded by the people that I finally wanted to be surrounded by. Yeah, those can be fun jobs. I know they can be stressful, though, too, especially if you think that there is no time limit for them. I think they're romantic for a while, but... There's also a trap of being in them too long, I think, that can really weigh people down. How do you handle, or how did you at that time, well-meaning comments maybe from family and friends um, that were like, that's great, you know, we love that you're still pursuing, like you're dancing and, and, and acting, but you're gonna need something more stable or you can't make real money from this, things like that. Well, coming from an Indian immigrant family, you've get those comments a little bit more maybe than usual. And I just handled it by, I'd be like, well, this is the money that I made on the commercial. And so I'll just like book another commercial and we'll see what's ha what happens. Obviously it's not that easy. You don't just go out and book another commercial, but I was making steady progress. So it, it did uh, something that my, my dad would say was, well, why don't you go to, get a master's in acting or it's it's always about more education and and I was like well you know I'm taking upright citizens brigade classes and I'm taking really fun um other drama type acting classes and I'm taking sketch writing classes and and everything I write like I get a little bit better every script I write is a little bit better than the one before and 
so I just really had to explain to my parents, like, this is what I'm doing. I'm continuously studying. I'm continuously growing. And I don't necessarily need to go do a master's program somewhere. So you show them, like, here's here's a residual check or here's whatever the buyout check that I got for this commercial. And, and maybe that quelled some of their anxiety. About yeah, I think it was more about can you pay the rent? Can you pay for your food? Are you eating healthy? Are you out on the street somewhere? And and so it was mostly about just having a stable life as opposed to, um, I think their version of the Hollywood dream was more people living on the streets and, and doing shady things to succeed. And I was like, you know, that's in your soap operas that you watch. <laughs> But that's not real life Hollywood. There's just a lot of people who are working really hard to achieve their dreams and continuously growing in terms of their art. And that's what I want to do. What kind of heart do you think it takes to pursue this business? Whew. A strong heart. <laughs> I believe as an actor, you face so much rejection, pretty much on the daily. And that has made me a stronger filmmaker, I believe. As a director, you're continuously facing rejection. And I'm really thankful that over these past few years, I've faced so much rejection as an actor that the rejection as a filmmaker doesn't affect me emotionally. <laughs> I just say, okay, so you didn't want it then I'm going to move on to the next person and they might say yes. And I'm going to move on to the, if that person says no, I move on to the next person. They might say yes. Because as an actor, you are continuously putting yourself on tape. You're continuously auditioning and you may book. I believe the statistic is one out of every 70 roles that you audition for. And so I take that mindset into my filmmaking and my writing and my directing as well. And aside from the rejection, what about seeing friends and peers at different levels around you? I mean, you've had great success, but I know maybe for others or even myself or even in the beginning, maybe you see that, oh, wow, this person is doing really well. And then you have to kind of like look at yourself and go, oh, wow, what ha like, how come I can't emulate that? I mean, that's, I think, human nature. We all yeah, so I think that is has personally happened for me. So when I started Awkward Black Girl, that was about 10 years ago, and I was on this journey with Issa Rae, and the only thing I took from that journey was something positive, which was to be continuously inspired by her and to follow the road that she has carved out for us. And I think it's really fun to watch your friends succeed. And I'm really excited. We have this really burgeoning South Asian American community slash Asian American community in Hollywood that we're finally starting to come together and support each other and support each other's projects. And, you know, Definition Please came out virtually um, through the festivals. And after that, even this year, I know of three other Indian American indie films that are shooting and I'm so excited to be able to support them and they have all my friends in it and and I did a cameo in one of them but it's exciting to watch the growth and I believe 10 years ago there was more of a competitive element to that like there can be only one so there can be only one South Asian American film coming out and there can be no others and that that thinking has changed completely. And I believe every, you know, a rising tide lifts all, lifts all boats. And it's really exciting to watch my friends grow and make their films and be able to put them out because I believe Hollywood has this way of making ethnic stories slash diverse stories, very monolithic, like one point of view, this is the only story that we're gonna tell about this group of people. And now we're seeing all these different kinds of stories with within that group of people. So it's exciting to watch. I think we're living in a fun, exciting time in terms of filmmakers of color. So maybe it's less so about competition anymore because so many people are creating their own work, whereas before it was waiting to be picked. 
Yes, yeah. Before it was, I'm just at home waiting for my agent to call me. And that's not a good, that's not a healthy place to be. You, it puts you in a, in a negative mental state. And it's exciting when, uh, like I said, I watched Issa create her own work, put Aqua Black Girl on her credit cards and um, succeed and make season two and get the kind of press that she got just on her own. And so I was like, I can do that. If she did it, I can also do it. So, so it pushed me to, okay, I'm gonna create my own content. I'm gonna put it on my credit cards. I'm gonna, I'm gonna generate my own press. And so, so it's really exciting because I believe nowadays we're all helping each other and there's a lot of positive energy and vibes going around. What else does it take to keep at this day after day, year after year? I love what I do. I'm so lucky to be doing what I do. I know that I come from a world where my friends are doctors, engineers, they work on Wall Street, they uh, are lawyers, they are business people. And I am so thankful that I have found a passion that I wake up every morning and I'm like, what can I do today? What kind of idea am I gonna be inspired by? It's, it's just really exciting to be an artist and that's what keeps me going. Just waking up in the morning and realizing that I get to live out my dream day after day and there are gonna be sad days when you like don't book a job or when your script doesn't go a certain way or where your film gets rejected by a festival. But the positive days outweigh the negative and that's what makes it exciting. And also in entertainment, your life can also change with one phone call. And I think the possibility of that keeps me going as well. Have you ever had long stretches of silence? And if so, how do you keep yourself motivated or what are you doing in between? I don't really have stretches of silence. I will say, I think the pandemic made everyone slow down. And within that pandemic, what I did was I put myself through my own kind of film school, I suppose. So I started watching, uh, I was taking movies off the AFI film list that I've never seen before. I'd never watched Goodfellas before. I'd never watched Midnight Cowboy. I'd never watched The Graduate, all these films that people talk about. And I was so blown away by all of them. I started watching more international cinema, um, Akira Kurosawa, and, Another thing that I did was I watched a bunch of television shows that people always talk about. I watched The Sopranos, I watched The Wire, I watched all of Twin Peaks. I just finished watching all of Larry Sanders. And that stuff inspires me. And it's exciting to watch these amazing actors, these amazing stories, this amazing dialogue. And even with like Twin Peaks, like the crazy, weird absurdness of it all. And, and I, I guess I did take that time to just learn and be inspired by others who have come before me. And that was exciting. So that, that's probably the only quiet time that I've had, but it's still very much soaking in knowledge and it, it's not time where I turn off my brain. I'm, I'm still learning from my quiet time. So during this quote unquote quiet time, did you create anything? I did. I was very productive. <laughs> and I wrote two features. I wrote three pilots and a couple of different pitches, had a couple different ideas. But I'm very excited about the projects that I wrote. And we've been taking them out, we've been pitching them. And, you know, if, if no one picks it up, maybe I'll just go do, go shoot it independently again. And so it, it's really exciting because I, I feel like I really found myself during the pandemic and found my voice and was able to sit down at the computer and the, the words were just coming through me and onto the page and it was, it was fun, it was fun. And, and, and I did focus on comedies during the pandemic and I think that was part of it where, you know, the world is going through this dramatic upheaval and I didn't want to pull that into my daily life. So I was making myself laugh every day.
Can you talk about living below your means and how you've adopted that early in your career so you don't want to maybe spend too much here or there, get too confident, like this amount's always going to be coming in? I have never really in my life needed like expensive stuff. (laughs) And I've always been able to live below my means. I'm really good at balancing my budget and my checkbook and even when I, I, I mean, when I was working at Accenture, I was making a ton of money. And so I did not spend that money. So I did not live how my coworkers lived. And my coworkers were buying BMWs and living in these like really fancy apartments in Manhattan Beach. And I, But I, I, I was always aware of my plan. <laughs> And I was like, oh, I got to save this money because who knows, like when I do get laid off or when I do, um, when Accenture finds me out (laughs) and realizes that I'm a terrible employee, then I'm going to need this money to live on. So just from there, starting there, I knew that I needed to save and I knew that I needed to live below my means because after that I was, you know, doing short films for uh, USC and UCLA that you don't get paid for. And I was doing a lot of free acting work just to get the tape. And, and I was, I was living off, you know, my center money for a while. And then, and then I would do the waitressing jobs and the restaurant jobs and, and that would pay the bills. And like I said, I would book a a co-star here and there or a commercial and, and that would be a nice chunk of money, which I knew again that I couldn't spend right away. Um, and so I, I'm, I've always been pretty good about living below my means. Something that one of my friends, Yvette Nicole Brown, told me that I always have in the back of my head is if you're a guest star, you should be living like a co star. If you're a recurring, you should be living like a guest star. If you're a series regular, you should be living like a recurring. And so I keep, I keep that in the back of my mind. And I think about that a lot. And I tell her all the time, I'm like, I'm always thinking about that. And she, she's, she gives good advice. So when you got, let's say the first big acting related check, did you have a temptation to, I want to splurge this on A, B, and C. And, and did you reward yourself or did you say, no, this is my, this is my winter money. I need this. I said, this is my winter money. I need this. I don't think I've, I've never splurged on anything unless I needed it. So my splurges have always been, if I have a 10 year old laptop, then I need to get a laptop because it keeps shutting down. (laughs) Or if I have a a six year old phone, then I'm going to get the new iPhone. Um, But I'm not someone who you know, the iPhone 13 just came out. I don't need to go rush out and get that. Um, I think I'm very happy with small rewards when I, when I book, let's say, you know, just like booking a commercial, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go get pizza for my favorite place, or I'm going to go get ice cream. Like, like food is something that I care about a lot. And the foods that I like aren't very expensive. <laughs> so, so that's a splurge for me. I, I'm not someone... I will only go out and buy a car if my car is on its last legs and undrivable. So I guess I'm like really good with money in that sense. And I had a, there's, I love to travel, um, but I have traveled a lot throughout my childhood and even up through college. So even when I moved to LA, I was like, oh, I don't need to go to Europe because I've already been to Europe or I don't need to go um, spend my money in Asia because I've been to Asia. So, so I, I would always keep that in mind and I'd be like, well, I, I actually need to get new headshots as opposed to, um, do something splurgy and crazy. So, so that something that you can reinvest back into, whether it's your acting career or a film is something you'll put money into, but it sounds like. Always, always will be, I'll be putting money back into my career. Right, but not, you don't need a new model of whatever car. No, no. And I love, I love Groupon. I love living social. I'm always looking for a deal. (laughs) (laughs) 
Where are some of the best places that an actor or creative can invest in themselves? What can they do? I believe the best thing that you can invest in is your work. So, for example, I did a, a short film in 2016 called Cowboy and Indian. And this is how it came about. Basically, I was doing my taxes and I noticed that there were these stocks that I had never noticed before. And I called the number <laughs> that was that was on the tax information sheet. And I asked, oh, what are these stocks? And they said, oh, these were gifted to you when you left Accenture. <laughs> and I said, excuse me? Okay, how much are they worth? And they said $5,500. And I said, send me the check. And they said, well, we don't recommend you cashing out. And I was like, send me the check. And I got a check for $5,500 that I put directly into funding my short film, Cowboy and Indian, which I wrote, produced, directed, and star in. And it was a really freeing experience because I gave myself the permission to fail on making that short because I knew it was my first short film, it would probably turn out to be a piece of shit. But guess what? Nobody was gonna be blamed except for me because I was putting my own money into it that I didn't even know I had. So it wasn't money that I needed to make back. I was just like, this was free money out there that was mine. And I had just discovered it. So I had already written the short film and it was a five page script and I, put my crew together, put my cast together, and we went out to the desert, to Joshua Tree to shoot it. It was a one day, one night shoot, and came back, went into post-production, and when I when it was finished, I said, oh, this isn't bad. <laughs> I was like, this is not a bad first short film. And I started submitting it to film festivals, and got, didn't get into any of the biggies, you know, didn't get into Sundance, TIFF, Tribeca or South By, but I got into a lot of Asian American film festivals and Indian American film festivals. And so I did the festival circuit. I traveled with it. Uh, I believe I got into over 15 film festivals in 2017, 2018. And it was just really fun. And it was amazing watching it on the big screen along with four or five other short films that were in the same block as mine. And I have never regretted putting that stock money into my short film. Was that part of like a 401k that they had? It wasn't part of a 401k. It was uh -huh. just, it was just stocks. It was, huh. it was stuff that you could actually cash out wow. and get the, the price of whatever it was at that time. How did you meet Issa Rae? So I met Issa Rae on Twitter. <laughs> this was like 10 plus a couple months, year ago, 10 years plus a couple months ago. And I had just left Facebook because I just thought Facebook was so dramatic and there was just too much going on with having your elementary school friends on there, with your middle school friends, with your high school friends, with your college friends, with your family. I was like, I, I need to like not be part of this chatter. So I left Facebook before it was even cool to leave Facebook. And as I left it, I said to myself, I was panicking a little bit and I said, well, I need some kind of social media. What's it gonna be? And then I saw that Twitter was happening and not happening like, today, but it was it was a newish platform. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna make a Twitter. And then I got on Twitter and I started following this, this person, Joshua, at Film TV Diversity. And he would tweet out different writers and producers and directors and creators to follow. So I would just click follow on every single one of them because I didn't know what I was doing on Twitter. And, and there was always really great advice coming from Twitter from the people I follow in terms of filmmaking. And then he had tweeted out, follow Issa Rae, she makes web series. And I said, great, followed her, she followed me right back. And then a couple days later, she tweeted out, I'm looking for a mixed looking girl to play my best friend in my next web series. And I DM'd her and I said, hey, I'm not mixed, but uh, this is what I look like, here's a picture of me. 
can I audition anyway? And she said, yeah, of course, come on down. And she gave me the address and I pull up to the house. This is a house in a nice neighborhood, but regardless a house. And for any actors watching out there, I don't recommend you go to a house for an audition that's super shady. You wanna drive away. <laughs> I did not drive away. <laughs> I, I was about to drive away, but then I saw Issa come out and she was talking on her cell phone. And I was like, oh, it's fine. It's a girl, it's a woman. Still not the right attitude to have. <laughs> so I went into the house, did the audition. It was super chill. I was there for about five minutes and then I left. And then a couple hours later, she said, you booked the role. And I said, okay, <laughs> cool. And then a couple weeks later, I went to Issa's dad's doctor's office in Inglewood, which where we would be shooting Awkward Black Girl. And we just shot a very quick 20 minute hallway scene that I believe is in episode three of Awkward Black Girl where my character is introduced. And it was just me, Isa, and her brother. And her brother was running the camera and the sound was definitely attached to, the microphone was attached to the camera so there was no separate sound system. We had to come hair and makeup ready. And uh, like I said, it took 20 minutes and then she, Issa said, thank you so much. And then I left and I asked myself, what did I get myself into? What is this web series? Like, <laughs> like nobody knew what web series was at the time. And that's how I met Issa Rae. That's a great story. You had been acting, what, eight years prior to doing Awkward Black Girl? Well, I've, I would say I've been acting since I was like five or six, just from back home, just putting on my own shows, putting on my own performances, and then doing plays in elementary, middle school, and then doing musicals and being in the chorus in middle school and high school. And so I've been acting, I would say, pretty much my whole life. Yeah. You did the web series for free, correct? Yes, I did. And that's an interesting decision. Which yeah, paid off. I think at the time I was doing a lot of stuff for free. So like I said, I was auditioning for AFI films. I was auditioning for USC films and UCLA films. And most of the time, those films didn't even get finished. And, and that was the tragedy of it all. Because I didn't mind doing working for free because it was always really fun. But I believe that a lot of the time the filmmakers came up against wanting their project to be perfect and then going through the post-production process and realizing that it wasn't what they had envisioned and then completely throwing it out. And I believe that is the wrong attitude to have as a filmmaker, as a creator. I truly believe that you should finish stuff and also put it out there and also submit it to festivals. And even if it's not what you thought it was gonna be, it could still be accepted as something else. And so that's the exciting part of it. Even if you have something that may not have the best production quality or the best acting or the best sound, just put it out there and guess what? You're gonna learn from that mistake and you're not gonna make that mistake again. And your next thing or project will be 10 times better. Oh, and then you just keep working. You just got to keep making stuff and putting it out and then make the next thing. So something that I like to point out is if you watch the first two or so episodes of Awkward Black Girl on YouTube, the production quality isn't great. The sound isn't great. But there's something there. There's something there that makes you keep coming back. And then you notice as those season one episodes go on, oh, they, I, I think they got lighting. I think they might have gotten <laughs> microphone. They might have gotten a sound person. Oh, their, their wardrobe looks a little bit better. <laughs> so I love Awkward Black Girl and that it, it is on YouTube and you can watch the progression of how it just keeps getting better and better. And, and I think that was, you know, when I was doing free projects, um, I was just excited to be meeting people and working with new people. And once again, just be surrounded by creativity. 
What do you think made that show so popular? What made Awkward Black Girl popular was that it reached an audience that was being ignored by Hollywood. And it was black women that were not used to seeing themselves on screen. And that's, that's what was really exciting about being a part of that journey and watching as the episodes came out one by one, watching the, the view count keep growing and it, it turned into a snowball and, and we were getting comments, we were getting DMs, we were getting uh, messages from people, oh my God, I've never seen myself on screen before, this is me. Uh, are, do you have a camera in my home? <laughs> are you watching my life? Are you watching my relationships? Are you watching my friendships? And that was the most exciting part of it because like I said, Hollywood has a way of taking a group of people and making the same story about them over and over and over again. And, and this was such a specific story from a specific point of view that had never been told before, that had never been on screen. And that was, that was part of why it became the success that it became. Um, season one, episode seven, after we ended that season, we did a Kickstarter. And we were looking for $30,000 to make the last, I believe, f four or five episodes. And we didn't know how much money we were going to raise. And, you know, even the not, I remember we were having, we were all kind of hanging out talking about, oh, how much should we ask for? Should we ask for 10000 Should we ask for twelve, fifteen? And then they decided on 30 and we ended up making $54,000. And once again, that was proof that there were people out there that needed to see this, that wanted to see this and wanted to see how the season was gonna end, what was gonna happen with White Jay and Jay and what was gonna happen with Jay at work and with her friends. And so, that's what was really fun and exciting to see that, oh, there is the possibility of creating something that appeals to a certain group of people that have never seen themselves on screen before. So that's what makes me so excited about creating my work. Sure, and you think too, because the characters were, it just wasn't about a stereotype, it was about these are real people, not, okay, this person fits this stereotype or demographic for this one role. We need this like character relief kind of thing. Yeah, I think it was successful because each character was a well-rounded individual. And a lot of the time, the, the audience, when they would message us, they would be like, oh, th my best friend is exactly like that. Or the guy that I'm dating is exactly like that. So, so we were tapping into something real and, and, non-stereotypical for sure. What did Issa Rae teach you about the business? What did you learn just by watching her? Issa Rae just taught me to be true to my point of view and get it out there no matter what, no matter how many rejections you get, no matter how many no's you get. Every person has a unique story to tell and each story is important and generally not out there yet. And there are audiences today that are not being served by what Hollywood is offering. So I'm just excited to fill that void of content. How did you end up on Felicia Day's The Guild after that? Oh, I don't get asked about The Guild too much. Oh, so this good. is okay. exciting. Okay. So I believe it was season two of Awkward Black Girl the Guild was also, I believe, one of the only other web series that it had been happening at the same time. So we were aware of The Guild. Um, the Awkward Black Girl squad, squad was aware of The Guild. And, and I, I believe it was just an audition. So I had gotten an email through my reps. Oh, Felicia Day's web series, they're casting for certain roles in their sixth and last season. And would you be down to audition? 
And I had known of Felicia Day. I had not been watching The Guild, but, but I kind of crash coursed it <laughs> when I went in for the audition. And, and it was really cool because as soon as I walked in, it felt like, oh, we're, we're like the two web series that are happening right now. This is really exciting. And they're both created by women, which was also an exciting thing. And so I went in and I auditioned, it was really fun. And I also booked that job and that was awesome to do. I believe it was happening at the same time when we were shooting Awkward Black Girl season two. So I was working on both of them at the same time and just had a blast and Felicia's great. And it was, it was, it was really awesome to watch cause they, they were in their sixth season. So to watch, to go from one web series to another that was so much ahead, like, like the, there were extras and there were big sets and, and it, was, it was fun. It was fun to be a part of that and to see where a web series could go if it went on for a couple more seasons. I'm curious why you didn't do Definition Please as a web series. Did you feel like it was better served as a feature? Or, or would you want to continue it on through many seasons? Because you could go many places with it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Definition Please to me was always a feature. And I'm not quite sure why I decided on that. I, I have projects that are specifically TV, projects that are specifically film. And, and for Definition Please, I, I didn't even really think of the idea until about 2015 when I was in my UCB sketch writing class and I wrote a four page sketch about spelling bee winners, which served as the basic premise for Definition Please. And then I had started going to Sundance in 2017 and that really inspired me to create a film to be honest. And, and this was also post Cowboy and Indian where I had made a short film. And once again, it was really fun taking it around to film festivals. So for me, Definition Please was never a web series and it was always a feature film. You think it could be at, at some point? I think my journey with Definition Please is over. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I want to see like a high school reunions, different things, you know, different, right, right. different dramas. Yeah. But. Yeah. I think, I think there is a world that I created that could, it could keep going and people want to know what happens after Monica moves to Cleveland. But I, I truly believe that once I'm done with the story, I'm pretty much finished with the story and, and, and I have, 10 or so other projects that I'd love to get off the ground and shoot. So I'm excited to move on to the next thing. Were you protective of Monica as a character? You know how they, they write like, you know, have horrible things happen to your character. I realize, you know, you weren't making that exact kind of film, even though there were family dramas. But were, was it hard to let Monica go? No. No. <laughs> I I have a way of detaching from my stories and characters. And so I want them to be real and be grounded and pursue the path that their character would take. And, and I don't take it personally as a writer or a filmmaker. And so I'm always excited. I think with Monica, I love that she is unlikable in the beginning of the film and, and you are kind of trying to figure out why she's so mean to her brother who seems really nice. And 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 I love writing flawed characters as well. So so it was it was just fun to write a character that had all these different things going on and wasn't fully good or fully bad. What would you say those two web series did for your career, The Guild and The Aqua Black Girl? They just put me on the map, I believe, in terms of exposure. Even at that time, I had just done season two of Awkward Black Girl. I had just done season six of The Guild. And then I got a call from my commercial agent. At this point, I did not have a theatrical agent. And they said, hey, the casting director, Arrested Development is coming back and the casting director wants to offer you a small role. And I said, what? How do they even know about me? I'm not auditioning for TV shows or films right now. And they said they had been watching 
web series and they just discovered me. So that was getting to do an episode of Arrested Development was really, really special and, and being on a f proper television set with hair and makeup and craft services and them picking out my outfit and being on set with uh, David Cross and Alia Shockett, that was just an experience that I will never forget because I wasn't expecting it at the time. Would you say you're here now because of those two series? Like, has your life, sort of your career, the trajectory of it, because of those series, at the timing was right, that it just brought other great things into your life, other roles? Oh, yeah. I credit Awkward Black Girl with pretty much my entire career and, and the path that I personally chose to take, which is creating my own content and putting my own stuff out there and taking risks and not sitting by the phone, waiting for it to ring, waiting for my agent to call me. Um, almost those calls, when they do come, are like presents because I'm continuing to make my own content. And then when my agent does call with something, I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's surprising and exciting. So, so I love that about my life. And definitely I credit everything to Awkward Black Girl. You talked about risk earlier, waiting by the phone, and now you know that you can take chances and a risk to create your own work. But even from a young age, it sounds like with the spelling bees, for however long that lasted, that's a risk. That was definitely a risk, especially at that time. I was a shy, introverted kid. So to get up in front of an audience, I remember that moment because when when you're in class of eight and you're just doing the spelling bee, there's no audience. It's just like you get your word right or wrong, and if you get it wrong, you just sit and you become the audience. And I was around my friends, so I do remember going to the regionals and seeing that huge audience, and that probably scared me off as well. So, you know what? I'm just making excuses for spelling the word radish wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, it, I because I see you as that you have a lot of, you, you wouldn't be fearful of of challenges, but it seems like you... Yeah, you I, I'm have, not yeah. fearful of challenges now. I will say, like I said, I was a shy, introverted kid, and then in seventh grade when I switched to public school and had all these friends, I looked in the mirror and I said to myself, I cannot be shy and introverted anymore. And then I just switched. Hmm. And then I was getting kicked out of math class because I was talking too much. There was a discussion on Twitter a few weeks back about the film community, the writing community, and the wrong way and the right way to do something. And I just wondered what your thoughts are on that. like. Is there a wrong way to make a movie? Is there a right way? You know, you talked about over the course of the pandemic, you made watching movies sort of your film school. But there is a dogma of, you know, this is the right way to do something, the right way to enter a scene, to end a scene. Do you feel that? Or everyone should have their own unique style? I don't feel like there's a right or a wrong way. I think there are greats that have come before us that we can learn a lot from and they all have their own styles and if you're watching something like David Lynch and Twin Peaks you notice that he he tends to break the rules and and go into melodrama which was like the best part about Twin Peaks I just I just loved it so much but then you then you watch something like Goodfellas and that feels like what uh a film buff would say is the right way to make a movie. But but I think I, I just love all kinds of movies, and especially if you watch international films, if you watch something that I'm really inspired by is Satyajit Ray, who is a Bengali filmmaker. I'm also Bengali, and he won an honorary Oscar in the 80s or the 90s. And he, what he did was he kind of broke off, well, he didn't want to make Bollywood type movies, which is what Indian, India was known for at the time. And he just went into the villages and started um, focusing on women in the villages. And, and he would write these amazing stories about 
just regular women and what they were going through. And, and it wasn't about being rich and it wasn't about musical dance numbers. And, and it was just like a quiet story. And so what I believe is there's not a right or wrong way to do or create art. And I think what's exciting to me is when you do get out of those boxes and, and we were talking about risk when you take a risk and, and maybe it doesn't pan out the way that you want it to in this project, then you don't do it again in the next one. You take a different kind of risk. And I love when projects surprise me. I love it when they go a certain way or do a certain thing that I'm not expecting. And that's what's exciting to me about art, which movies and TV shows fall into as well. Has anyone said that to you? Like, this should be more this? If you if you do it more this way, it'll have more marketability? I believe that happens more in the screenwriting process and not really in the filmmaking process. I, I, I get notes from my scripts and my pitches. And honestly, most of the time, the notes are make the project better. So it allows me to think about the project in a different way that I may not have seen before. And, and that's what's really exciting. Sometimes what happens is you'll go through like a circle of notes, taking you back to that same place where you started. But now you're more clear about why you started with that story. So it's I appreciate notes. I love getting very hard, critical notes on my work. and. And I won't necessarily take 100% of the notes, but each note allows me to think about the scene or my characters or the work in a different way. So I'm like, okay, where is this note coming from? What is the person not uh, attaching onto? What, what are they not getting in this part? And that's where the actual note is coming from. So getting notes to me is very, very awesome because generally every time I've gotten notes and I've done the rewrite, it's a better script than what I had written before. Did anybody give you notes with definition, please? Like, can you make it go more in this direction and then we'll have more marketability for it? Because it's really just a story about, you know, coming, being a young person, whether you want to leave the nest or stay in your small town. It doesn't have to be Bollywood. It was just an experience that happened to be different cultures that all came together and knew each other from high school. Yeah, I, I got the, I got one note that I got, I believe it was during the script process, was someone needs to die. Like it needs to be in this climax moment, like one of the family members needs to die. And I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think that needs to happen. I'm really just trying to, you know, make it a slice of life. And um, this could be any family. It just happens to be a South Asian American family in the center of it all. And that's what was exciting to me, just to show Indian Americans as normal people, just like everyone else. I think mostly when I when I soft pitched it around to production companies that I already had relationships with, they all said that it was too small of a film for them to take on without really giving me any notes in terms of like, oh, if you made it like this, maybe we could we could shoot it. But uh I understood that pass or that, you know, that rejection per se, because because it, it is a small film and it's about, you know, there's no explosions and there's no, you know, big special effects or anything. So it's not one of the five studio films that that, you know, a big studio would make. Um, but I, I wanted to make this for myself just to just to get a story out there that I had never seen before on screen. Do you see that ever, though, in the film industry or, you know, with, with film and TV writing, screenwriting, that there's a, there's definite, like, this is the wrong way, this is the right way? I think there's definitely a formula to telling big budget films. So if you're writing a big budget film for a studio, then there is absolutely a correct way to do that. And... Uh, I don't know if you guys have read Thomas Lennon's book called How to Write Movies and Make Profit. How to make movies, how to make movies for fun and 
for fun and profit, and fun is crossed out. And one of the first <laughs> one of the first things that he says in the book is, if you're making a movie for Sundance, you need to put this book down, and gives really explicit instructions on how to write and create a studio film. And I just love the book because I have applied it to my indie films that aren't necessarily studio films, but but it's also a really easy read and it's funny and it's fun to get through and it's awesome to hear his experiences and stories as a studio screenwriter as opposed to me who's who's writing for indie films. But but yes, I do believe that there is a correct way to write a studio film with certain beats and certain explosions and certain moments that happen between the stars of the film that you have to have in there, or else those stars won't do the film. How have you found your voice as an artist? I've just written stories that I want to write. I've never tried to write something that I don't want to write. And, and I'll explain that in a way that I've, I've been pitched certain books or IP, and, and at first it'll be exciting, but then I'm like, I'm not, I don't care about this. I don't care about this subject. I don't care about this uh, world. So then I don't do it. So I don't do anything that I don't want to do. And most of the time I'm excited about my original stories and, and I'll get an idea whether I'm inspired by a moment in my life or I'm inspired by a song or I'm inspired by a hike that I went on. Those are the things that excite me and, and keep me going from, from the seed of the idea to writing the outline to writing the entire script. If I'm not excited about that seed of the idea, then I can't keep moving forward in order to finish that script, which is what I always want to do. Like I said, I always want to have a finished product. I have a ton of friends who start scripts and then never finish them. Or like I said, they start short films and never finish them. But I think the most important thing to do, especially with the first draft of writing a script, is just finishing it. The first draft is what I always call a vomit draft, and it's never any good. But guess what? It's 90 pages long. Great. I've reached my goal of 90 pages. Now, the hard work is rewriting the first draft. So then I rewrite it, and, and I get it to a place where I think it's okay to be seen by the four or five people that I trust to give me good critical notes on my scripts. And then, and then I get those notes and then I continue to rewrite, continue to rewrite. But for me, it's always about getting that page count to 90 pages, especially with the first draft and then proceeding with the rewrites from there. That's interesting. Do you think the math science part of your brain has really trained you to make sure that you finish things that, that that there's a that it all works out somehow. yeah yeah I really do and it's so strange because because that didn't click until a few years ago where where I'm really structured about writing scripts and I'm like okay I'm gonna write 10 pages this week and then 10 pages next week and I write it down in my planner and I cross it off once I'm done and I get to 20 40 60 80 and 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 that really excites me and so um I, I remember one thing from all of my engineering years. I walked into my first class um, in college and the teacher wrote out engineer equals problem solver. And I said, huh. I said, I am a problem solver. And, and I use that in all of my work. I use that in my screenwriting. I'm like, okay, well, how do I get this character out of this situation? Okay, how do I... How do I finish the script? How do I, what's, if I've already written the end, how do I get there? What are these middle scenes in between? Um, even with uh, being on set of Definition Please, I kept thinking about engineer equals problem solver and I was like, okay, we've lost this location. How am I gonna problem solve getting a location without freaking out my cast and crew in the meantime? And so I do believe uh, I, my training as 
an engineer and in math and science has truly helped my artwork. Because even in, um, I mentioned that I also write poems and I write songs and I had written poems and then I got together with my friend Will Collier who composes our music and he taught me the basic structure of a song. And I could take that structure and I'm like, oh, great. I can definitely follow this formula to write this song. So once again, that was my math mind writing an artistic song. I love that. If you were to be the teacher at a screenwriting course or filmmaking and you wrote screenwriter equals, we actually have a chalkboard here, but screenwriting equals, and what would be the other word on the end of the equal sign? I'm going to say problem solver. <laughs> okay. Screenwriter equals problem solver. Yeah, okay. because you're always solving problems. You're you're coming up with the premise and you're always putting your characters into problematic situations that they have to get out of. And only you can take them out of those situations. And, and that's part of what's exciting. You let the characters guide you into their own stories and, and you are now solving their problems. Okay, and then actor equals? Entertainer. Okay. And last but not least, filmmaker equals? Visionary. I like it. How do you know what you're creating is coming from your unique voice? When I'm excited about it. So something that was really fun for me on Definition Please is that when we started shooting, I... the. Day before we started day one of shooting, it felt like the way you feel before the first day of school. And I was really excited and I couldn't really get to sleep, but I knew that I had to sleep. And that's when you know, that's when you know you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and you're telling a story that's unique to you and your point of view when you're in that moment and you just can't wait to wake up in the morning and, and get to work and tell the story that you've been living with for a few years. And that that's what's exciting to me. When I can be excited about rewriting a script that, that I had uh, poured my unique voice into and, 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 you know, be able to change that or adjust it and make it a better story and and I just get excited like I said during the during the pandemic when I was um, pushing out all these scripts it was just a joy to sit at my laptop and get back into these lives of the characters that I had created and in each one of those characters had their own unique voice, which wasn't necessarily mine. So it was exciting to take on those roles as well. Well, you say you don't take something on unless it excites you. So you already know once you've taken something on, you know that you're committed to it. You're not going to, you know, because some people might be persuaded, oh, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it. But it sounds like you already know, you have a, a real definition inside of you that you know this is something I'm gonna stick with. I have no problem saying no to things. So I have walked away from a lot of big projects and ideas that may have made me a lot of money, but that I wasn't necessarily excited about. So that that's number one. I listen to my voice. I listen to how I feel when I'm reading something or being pitched something. And so, I I suppose I have the Marie Kondo philosophy of, oh, is this gonna bring me joy? And generally, if it's my original idea, yes, and then I continue on with that. But if it's someone else's idea, then I really have to think about it and say, okay, is this gonna bring me joy or, or am I gonna get stressed out? And, and I'm not someone who gets stressed out ever. So, so the, those are my two questions that I ask myself in terms of taking on a role or taking on someone else's work in terms of writing or directing it. So have you ever rethought something that you turned down and thought, hey, no, oh, no, you were very clear on it. Yeah, very clear, very clear on it. I, 
I don't regret anything in my life. And, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, well, don't you regret going to engineering school instead of going to acting school or and getting an arts education. And, and like you mentioned, I use my engineering and my math and science background to uh, create my scripts, to create my stories. And they have gone hand in hand, which is really exciting. So I've, I've never regretted anything, any decisions that I've made in the past. What compels you to write? Different things, different ideas. I'm always inspired by experiences. So I think it's really important for writers to go out and experience life and not just be sitting in their room all day and writing. So, you know, something that I really loved from my Upright Citizen Brigade improv and sketch classes, one of the assignments that a teacher had given us was go out and do something new this week, something that you wouldn't necessarily do. Try something new. So I think during that class, I, I ate insects for the first time, which I didn't really love. I, f I think I watched like an old action movie. I'm not really into action movies, so I just kind of watched that. And, and it was great because you have to expand your mind. You have to learn about different things. And, and those things will inspire you. So whether it's a character who's really into action movies, whether it's it's a scene at a restaurant where they're only serving insects, whether it's, so I, those different experiences will inspire something and strike a match in your brain for maybe not a project that you're currently working on, but maybe something in the future. And so, so I continue to do that even after taking the class. I continue to read something that I wouldn't normally read or, or try a new food that I that I wouldn't normally try. And that's that's what's exciting to me. Just new experiences, I believe, inspire me all the time. How do you create a meaningful story? I think as long as you're telling the story from your heart, then other people will gravitate towards it. So I wanted to tell a story about a specific type of family that went through universal problems and and I wasn't sure what an audience was going to think about it and and I really made it for myself and I made it for my friends and family because I knew that they would enjoy it and then all of a sudden different audiences were pulled towards it and really enjoying the film. And that was that was kind of a surprise to me. <laughs> but but it's exciting to to find out that your story that you put a lot of heart into is also emotionally affecting other people as well. Did people come up to you after screenings? I mean, we didn't have a lot of screenings because of COVID. Oh, so these so, are virtual festivals? So, so it was more through um, tweeting at me or direct messaging me or through emails where I was learning that these uh, these people, these audience members who had watched the movie really enjoyed it and really felt connected to it and felt something, they felt seen. You talked about making sure you only do projects that you feel compelled to do, that you don't want to do something, you don't want to go to something you don't want to be at. What's your thought on creating a story that's emotional versus one that's more commercial? I like them both. I'm trying to create both stories. I think it's possible to create a commercial story with emotion and heart. And I think that's that's the beauty of making a big budget film and you can sneak heart in there. <laughs> But but show it to a wider audience, and that's exciting to me. I think I I love comedy, so I'm gonna stick to comedic stories. But even within that comedy, I believe there's gotta be heart, no matter what budget you're making the project for, and 
yeah, I, I have ideas that are very commercial and I'm looking at it from my own specific, unique point of view. And, and I haven't seen necessarily those stories commercially out there yet. So it's exciting to also create for a bigger budget. So you don't think there's commercial stories that have some type of a, a meaning? Maybe just a few out there? I think there are definitely commercial stories that have that have heart and meaning. And I think even more so today, since studios are only making five or six movies a year, they have to find a way to make sure that these audiences coming in relate to these characters on a certain level and and are rooting for them. And so that, I mean, for example, I just watched a film and I don't know if you would call it big budget, but Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar. And I thought it was so funny, so absurdly comedic, but there is a story there about female friendships and 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 I just love that and it it is a you know bigger budget film with with stars and and so that that's the kind of work that I'd love to make at some point sure was that an a24 movie that was a Lionsgate film. Oh, okay. All right. I thought I've seen trailers for it and I, I looked cute. I was like, okay, I would watch it's it. It's great. Yeah. I loved it. How did you learn to write screenplays? I took a semester of playwriting in college and also a semester of screenwriting. So in our screenwriting class, we had a book called The Screenwriter's Bible, which taught us the, the structure and the technical aspects of screenwriting. And we were supposed to have a finished script coming out of that class, which I did not. I, I believe my script was about 50 pages long and, and I actually went back recently to go look at that script to see if there was something I could salvage out of that story. And it was just terrible. It was so bad. And, and, and I thought that was really funny because I'm like, oh, that just means, you know, I've grown so much since that first script that I never finished. And and now my scripts are, like I said, each script that I write is is better than the last one. And that's, was, that's what's exciting is to see the progression of writing from a class, my first class, to, to my writing now. Why was it terrible? It... The story just was didn't really make any sense, I guess. And the characters didn't have specific point of views and they were just in these scenarios and scenes with no rhyme or reason. <laughs> it was just really bad all across everything. So they were just sort of like situations and yeah. there was no conflict. And yeah, yeah. And like I said, it, I never finished it. It was about 45 to 50 pages. And, and I don't even think when I looked back on it, I think I read the first two or three pages and I was like, oh, I don't, I don't need to finish reading this shitty script that I wrote back in the day. So stage plays also, you said you learned to write. Why, why not focus on that as well? well? What is it about the screen? So something about stage plays, because even when I was asked by Accenture, where do you want to live? Obviously, I had a couple of different cities in mind. It was Los Angeles, New York, and Chicago. And I really decided that I was going to forego the New York City theater scene because I didn't feel like I ever saw uh, people of color in Broadway plays and so it just didn't feel like the right place for me and that I wouldn't get any work and so but I was always seeing people of color in commercials and stuff so that's what made me move to Los Angeles and that was the same kind of thinking um, in terms of going into playwriting or screenwriting I did not see plays that were written by or for people of color to be honest um, or enough of them but I had, like I said, I had watched Satyajit Ray films and I had seen and I knew Bollywood was a big thing in our, our culture. And so I was inspired by the films and the TV that I watched and it felt more attainable to me. 
Why is it so important to write a perfect first draft? It's not important to write a perfect first draft. I, like I said, I always write a vomit first draft and it's actually terrible. And writing is all about rewriting. So for me, I'm just trying to get to the page count. And once I get to 90, I get really excited and that is cause for celebration. And then I go back and I look at my draft and it's terrible. And so I look through it and I do my own version of a second and third drafts of that. And then that's when I get to send it off to my four or five friends that I trust to give me critical, smart notes that will actually help move the script along. And then I gather those notes and I read through them and, and I see if any of the notes are actually similar. And I tackle those notes first. And then at this point, I'm at the fourth, fifth, draft of the script and it's getting there but it's not perfect and then I I tend to finish a script when it's on its sixth or seventh draft. That many okay. Do you outline? I do outline. So going back to Thomas Lennon's book <laughs> How to Write Movies for Fun and Profit he has this really great chapter of outlining where his outlines are like 20 pages long. So if you do a very specific long outline where you know exactly what the scenes are going to be and who the characters are in each scene, you can transfer that into final draft and then have just the scenes in there, but then you are writing the characters and the dialogue. So when you transfer it over to final draft, it's already like 15, 20 pages in. And so it's way easier to write and finish a script if you have an amazing outline and you know exactly where it's gonna go. And then you can even hop back and forth. So what's exciting to me is, like I said, I, I don't write unless I'm getting joy from the script. And so maybe I wanna write the ending first. So then I write the ending because I already know what scenes are necessary to get to the end. So then I just write that ending and then I work backwards. So your writing process sounds like it, it varies. It's not like you start a script the exact same way every time. It varies with each project. And sometimes I'll just get an idea and I'll start writing and I'll be like, oh, I'm writing. Where's this gonna go? Maybe it goes nowhere, but maybe it does go somewhere. And so every project that I write, it's, it's a different process in terms of getting it down on the page. Even with Cowboy and Indian, when I wrote Cowboy and Indian, I saw it more visually than with a lot of dialogue. So I just wrote the visions of the scenes down and then it, it was birthed out of that. So going, so going back to the Twitter thread from a few months ago that I saw about the right way and the wrong way to do something and sort of, you know, the film community and their opinions on it, it sounds like you just have different styles for each script that you work on and it all ends up working out. It just, there's no real process that you follow every time for each one. There's no real process that I follow and, and I think that that's what keeps it fresh in my mind and that's what keeps me coming back to screenwriting with my every story every idea that i have there's a new way to approach it and whether it's uh thomas lennon's way of approaching something which i, I really connected to or whether it's just writing down certain uh, ideas or visions or what the cinematography is going to be, then that's that's a whole different way of looking at approaching a script. With engineering classes, did they teach you the same different ways to approach problem solving? So it won't be A, B, and C every time for the same problem. Yes. So uh, something that I went through after, as I was getting my degree, was I was interviewing for a lot of different jobs. And even though I had the Accenture jobs, I would go to these interviews to be like, oh, maybe they're going to offer me more money. <laughs> Who knows? 
And so I was in an interview for McKinsey Consulting, which is one of the big fancy consulting groups that a lot of Ivy League graduates work for. And they ask the same type of questions in these interviews, which are big, quite big macro questions that don't necessarily have a correct answer, but they want to see your brain process of how you would get to that answer. So one of the questions that I remember getting in this McKinsey consulting interview was how many French fries does McDonald's make every year? So how would you go about answering that question? Mm. And there's different ways to go about it. There's, you know, you could start with, okay, th what does the McDonald's sign say? Serving this many million people every year? You could start from there and work backwards towards, okay, how many, how many French fries are in one pack? How many, how many people come through there per day? And how many cities are there in the United States? How many McDonald's are there in America? So you, you go through this process and you have to say the process out loud to the interviewer so they can understand your brain thinking skills. And then you get to a number at the end, but it could be a totally unrealistic number. It doesn't matter what that number is. It's about how you got there. Can you tell us more about how you wrote definition, please? Yeah, so I was in a UCB sketch writing class in 2015, and every week we had to write a new sketch. So always coming up with new different ideas. And one of my sketches was entitled Spelling Bee Winners, Where Are They Now? Which was based on my fourth grade spelling bee experience. And if you research spelling bee winners, they are all doing amazing things. They are working for NASA. They are designing robots. They are winning the world poker tournaments. And, and I just thought it would be funny if one of these spelling bee winners grew up to be unsuccessful, a loser, living in their mom's basement, playing video games, just not doing much with her life. So that was, that was the gist of my sketch. And this was four pages long. And then I, in, at the end of 2016, I got into a Sundance screenwriting lab and I went to the screenwriting lab and it was really inspiring and amazing. And in 2017, a couple months later, I decided to go to the Sundance Film Festival for the first time. And I went as a Sundance influencer. Uh, Sundance asked me to take over their Instagram and their Twitter and go to certain events and interview people. And it was actually a great way to experience a first Sundance kind of within the Sundance family. And my friend Justin Chan's film Gook was playing there. And so I went to the premiere of Gook and was just completely blown away by the film. And I cornered him at his post party and I asked him how he got it made. And he said, I just uh, got money from my friends and family and we just went out and made it ourselves. And I was like, great, that's what I'm gonna do. So I went back home after that first Sundance and started jotting down ideas for Definition Please based on that sketch that I had written uh, two years prior. And then throughout 2017, I worked on the first draft. In 2018, I worked on subsequent drafts of the film. And a question, I started with that premise of, okay, what happens when a spelling bee winner grows up to not fulfill her potential? And I took that question and I asked, okay, what, what would be the reasons why this would affect her in, in not taking a job somewhere, in um, moving on with her life? And, and I decided to answer those questions by, oh, it's her relationships with her family, with her mom, with her dad, with her brother, and, and her community in general. And so I incorporated those aspects into my script. And as I believe at the end of 2018, I had my shooting draft of my script and I was ready to either uh, get a production company on board to shoot it or shoot it myself. And you approached family and friends? So, <laughs> in terms of 
making the movie, I had gone back to Sundance in 2019, this time with HBO, and Justin's next film, Ms. Purple, was premiering there. And I got out of that screening and I was like, Justin has made two films in the time that I told him that I was gonna make my film. I am disappointing myself with not getting out there and shooting my film. Then and there I decided I'm gonna shoot Definition Please in the summer of 2019. And so this was January 2019. As soon as I decided, I got an email out of the blue saying that a show that I had sold to a studio was caught up in the merger, in the Time Warner merger, so they were now releasing the rights back to me along with sending me a gigantic check. So I was like, well, this is a sign because I had just decided to shoot my film so I took that check and put it into Definition Please, and I was the first money into my film as an investor. And then I got back from Sundance and I just went full force in raising money. Everyone I talked to, everyone I had coffee with, everyone I was hanging out with, I would say, hey, can you put money into my movie? Or do you know of anyone who would put money into my film? And so the thing with, artists and actors in LA is they don't necessarily have a ton of money to just be willy-nilly investing in other people's films. But they do have cousins and they do have friends who are maybe necessarily not in the industry. So they want to dip their toes into the industry. And something that I noticed was that since I had already put money into my film, it was easier to get other investors on board and put money into the film. And then we just raised all the money and we were, as we were raising the money, we were prepping to shoot. So we were getting our crew together, we were getting our cast together, and I did not have auditions for the cast. I just texted my friends who I knew would be right for the roles and a lot of them luckily said yes and were down to come to Greensburg to shoot my little film with me. And then we got to Greensburg and we shot the film. Where did you put everyone up? Did they stay at your parents' house? No, no. We actually got um, an extra producer came in at the last minute and we got this influx of money, which was really great. And we got to put everyone up at a Hampton Inn nearby. Oh, nice. okay. And they all had a blast. It was next to a Sheets. I don't know if you're from familiar with Sheets in Western Pennsylvania, but Sheets is an MTO sort of attached to a gas station. But they make these incredible sandwiches, especially breakfast sandwiches that I'm obsessed with, called schmiskets, schmuffins, schmagels, and the, just these delicious fresh foods. And the Hampton Inn was walking distance from a sheet. So a lot of our cast and crew also got obsessed with sheets <laughs> like I am. So that was really exciting. But, the, but what was also really amazing about the Hampton Inn was it was only about two or three years old. So it felt like a new hotel. And they had breakfast every morning. And, and I really believe in taking care of cast and crew. And it just makes the overall atmosphere of the film uh, just better. And if, if the cast and crew are happy, then you'll have a good product. And everyone will be working well together. And, and I truly believe in that. So I was really excited to be able to put everyone up in, in a nice-ish hotel and give them rental cars and oh wow um, and fly them out and and it was great it's interesting because two of your your very important projects all came with a found like newfound money like a check that showed up that you weren't really expecting i just find that interesting yeah and you know what like sometimes when people get newfound money they spend it in different ways they'll put a deposit on a house, they'll take a trip, they'll um, d decide to start a family or what have you. And, and for me, my priority has always been my work. And so I, there is never any question of, I'm going to put this money back into my work, obviously. 
I have a quote here, I think, from you. I decided to take it into my own hands and write the dream role I always wanted to play. So I've been in Hollywood for a while, and I've auditioned for a lot of roles. And a lot of the roles that I was auditioning for tended to be the, the same type of roles. So they were very... They were stereotypes. They were putting me in a box of these characters would be going through an arranged marriage or they would have strict parents or they would be uh, pursuing a career that they didn't necessarily want to pursue, but they were too afraid to do the other thing. And so I just noticed, you know, like a couple of those roles, I'm like, oh, okay, this, this feels interesting. This feels like a new way of telling the story. But then it just kept happening, that it was the same role over and over. And and I just, I didn't really understand it. But then, but then I understood that Hollywood sees different ethnic groups as monoliths and only sees this person in this type of role as, as a doctor or, or a smart uh, tech person. And... So for me, I just wanted to be able to play a role where, where it was more nuanced. And maybe there are bits and pieces of that, as, as in, in Definition Please, Monica does have a science background, which is somewhat of a stereotype, but I wanted to take that, that, that genius stereotype and that science background and m merge it into something new. And that I hadn't seen before. And, and, and I said, okay, well, you know, she smokes weed and she hooks up with guys and, and she's pretty chill, except in this one family department. And so it, it was exciting for me to play and create a role that had so many facets to it instead of this one thing. And, and that's what I set out to do. In terms of casting, the roles in my film. Uh, a really fun story for me was when I uh, got a hold of Anna Kaja, who plays Jaya, the mom in my film. And she said, yeah, of course, send me the script. And then I sent her the script and she responded by saying, I've played a lot of South Asian moms. She has played uh, Priyanka's mom in Quantico. She has played Jamila's mom on The Good Place. She has played Ritesh, who is plays the role of Sunny in my film, she played his mom on his TV show, Stitchers, already. <laughs> so she had already played his mom before. And she said, I've never seen this role before. And this is really exciting because the mom in my movie has such a fun arc. And she said that it was just going to be really fun to play that role because she had never been offered something like that before. And, and that was exciting for me to hear because I wanted to not only write the role for myself that I wanted to play, but I wanted to write other characters that my friends who had maybe been offered certain types of roles in the past, that they would also be excited to come in and be like, oh, I've never gotten to do this before. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And your brother has an arc too. Pretty, yes, pretty yes, intense arc, yes, all the, we, all the yeah. characters. I, I definitely wanted to make sure that e every single character has, has their own story and their own journey. How do you feel about actors who refuse to write roles for themselves, create their own work? So they don't want to be put in a box. They don't want to have to play the same type of person over and over again, but then they're not willing to create work that they actually want to watch. I feel that a lot of people are different and and some people just don't have uh, like the patience or the discipline to sit down at a computer and write their own roles. But then I say, you got to go out and make writer friends. <laughs> you got to make these writer friends. You got to make these filmmaker friends, these director friends and and get them excited about your story. Get them excited about the roles that you wanna play and that you haven't seen. So if you feel like you can't do it yourself, then surround yourself with other creative people who maybe can do that for you. And in this day and age, do you think it's reasonable for people not to wanna to create their own work? Because it's, it's not about sitting home waiting for someone to call anymore. So much of work is self-generated today. 
I think in this day and age, you, you really do have to go out and create your own work and there's no excuses anymore. Like I said, the iPhone 13 just came out and if you've looked at the cinematic mode of that iPhone, you can make an amazing short film shot on the iPhone 13 and get sound equipment from Amazon and just have it have really great cinematic quality and have really great sound. And you don't even have to go that far. There are TikTok videos that I watch of different people and their parents and their grandparents that are just as exciting. And even if you don't feel like you can go as far as to make a short film, you can make little videos on TikTok or YouTube or Instagram Live and figure out what works for you and maybe put videos up on Snapchat. And if that doesn't work for you, then take another path. Like I said, it's all about taking risks. It's all about actually doing it. So even if you think, oh, I can't write this for myself, then make a friend, go to these UCB sketch writing classes, go to these improv classes. You'll make friends in those classes. That's what I've done. And then you continue to work with those people that you really gel with. And that's what's exciting. So find your community and cr all create work together. Do you wish you had started writing earlier in your career? I started writing pretty young. So I started writing short stories and poems and songs since, oof, I don't know, second grade or something. I was always really into my books. I was always really into stories when I would go to um, the Indian parties with my parents on the weekends, graduations, birthdays, and anniversaries, and Thanksgivings. I was always sitting in the corner reading my book, just into my stories, and that inspired me to write my own stories. And so I've, I've written stories that I've transferred into scripts. And so I started writing very young and I was always really good. Like I mentioned, I was really good at math and science, but I was also good at English too. So that was part of it. And I enjoyed writing. It gave me a break from the, from the rigid structure of math and science. And, and it was always a stress reliever for me. So I, I really enjoyed writing from a very young age. So transferring it over to screenwriting wasn't a hard thing to do for me. So when you would be going to those parties and family barbecues, whatever, and you had the book, were people like, put the book down, come join us, what are you doing? Never, never. That That's not an Indian thing to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They'd okay. be like, oh, she's studying. Oh, Even though I'd be own. reading okay. like Babysitter's Club or Sweet Valley Twins or Sweet Valley High, I wouldn't necessarily be studying. But but in the Indian American community, you don't really stop uh, a kid from reading okay. ever. Do you feel you have a choice to write, direct, and act? Or it's a compulsion? Like you can't not do it. It's a compulsion. And I think it goes back to your first question of having a backup plan. And there's honestly, I think there have been various acting classes that I've been in out here and they always say if there's anything else that you want to be doing you need to go out and do that instead of being in entertainment there's honestly nothing else i would rather be doing and i know that if i had stayed at that job at accenture i would be making millions and millions of dollars at this point and been promoted and that just wasn't it for me and it it's not about the money and it's about waking up every day and getting to live my dream. And that's what keeps me going. And that's where the compulsion comes from. Do you ever have friends that took that path and there's nothing wrong with that path who say, wow, I, I secretly envy you. I, I love that you went out on your own and you kind of forged your way and you didn't worry about whether you had this title or that at this point? All the time. Lots of friends who went a certain path that they were maybe supposedly had to go down because of uh, what their parents said or just because of what a community says or what society says in general, what you can and cannot do with your life, what you have to be doing at the age of 25, at the age of 27, at the age of 30. And uh, 
yeah, there are a lot of friends that are envious of what I'm doing. And um, I'm just really happy to be living the life that I'm living. How many characters have you actually created for yourself? Whew. Multiple. I've created so many characters for myself. And some of those characters have probably never made it to the screen, but they're still on the page or they're still in my mind. And, and it's exciting because none of them are the same. And they're all based on maybe something small, something real that has happened to me, an experience or a thought or an inspiration. Um, but but all those characters are so different. And that's what's exciting because there are so many roles that I've created for myself that I'm excited to play very soon and to uh, imagine them visually on screen is, is, is what I live for. What's one that you haven't created yet that you want to play? Like it, it would really take you out of your comfort zone or challenge you? I felt like my role in Definition Please was pretty challenging. That's one of the most dramatic pieces that I've ever written. It's definitely a dramedy, but but it it, it leans into that drama uh, for bits of the script. And, and I think going to those vulnerable places as an actor, I was just really lucky to surround myself with amazing actors that truly brought it and and made me a better actor. And so um, playing the role of Monica in Definition Please was very challenging and very fulfilling on its own. And, and, and I believe that there are roles percolating in my head that, that I'm not aware of that, that will come out at some point. And I'm excited to face the challenge of those roles too. And I know you get asked this a lot, but how much of Sujata was in that role? Not a lot. Not a lot. I think, uh, like I mentioned, the, the entire script was based on me winning the my class spelling bee. So I obviously never won the national spelling bee, or else it would be Googleable. <laughs> but uh that definition, please, and that character was based on a lot of different experiences and people that I've come across in my life. Um, being around a really large, flourishing Indian American community in Western Pennsylvania, and then also college and after college, I, I took little pieces of of my life to create the fictional world of definition, please. And so instead of a coming home story, it's a leaving home story because the character has options. She just chooses her surroundings. Yes. Okay. And I, I, okay. Maybe I'm, I'm, I don't know spoilers here, but how come not, not a coming home story where, you've, where you decided to come home to um, the same situation, but you, you had the career? What was the difference? Why did you, why did you do the opposite? I think what was really exciting for me to explore with Monica is the idea of a stunted growth, the idea of I've been successful. I've had the peak of my life. What is ever going to be better than winning the National Spelling Bee? And those thoughts in your head, oh, nothing's ever going to top that. It's like being the quarterback of the winning team senior year of high school and then 20 years later you are not really doing much and so that that kind of story is exciting to me of like a stunted growth of of how is this how is my life like and how can I get out of it as opposed to a coming home story I feel like I've seen that many times before and and I wanted to explore something new in terms of a in terms of what you said a leaving home story Oh, so reliving the glory of these different because some people high school was not their glory time. Yes. <laughs> and and it's that was actually an awful time and they don't want to relive it. But then there's others that they do, you're right, they peak at a certain age. And I do I would imagine that would be very difficult. And 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 then they don't nothing sort of the magic never happens again. Yes, yes. I so. think that's that's what's exciting to me, that that story.